Hello, my finest of friends. Welcome to another Rahalastapa, uh, another rare one on video because we did this one remotely in the time when I had COVID, just, just getting over it. Um, it's with the lovely, the very talented, the very funny and the very honest and open Gronya Maguire. You're going to love it. We're back doing these live um, in the coming weeks. Look at richtang.com slash gigs. I'm at the Leicester Comedy Festival talking to Rebecca Wheatley and Jos Norris. And then I'm at the Leicester Square Theatre from the end of February, most Mondays right through to April. Uh, if you're a monthly badger, you'll know a couple of the names already. If you go to rahalastapa.co.uk and look at your secret area. If you become a monthly badger, you can find out um, gofasterstripe.com slash badges. But uh, we're aiming high and we've already got some brilliant names. So do book ahead because they will all sell out. My finest of friends, richardherring.com slash gigs. Thanks very much for watching. Enjoy the rest of your young lives. And let's sit back and relax and enjoy Rahalastapa with the amazing Gronya Maguire. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome a man who's still wearing the same pyjamas as he was wearing last week. He's disgusting. It's Richard Herring. Hello. Welcome to the show. That's not, is that, where is that? Uh, I think my buttons might have stopped working. That's a shame. Um, yeah, never mind. It doesn't matter for you, most of you, what listen to the podcast. Welcome to Richard Herring's Lockdown Suitcase of Tipples podcast. Uh, yes, it's a, it's a topical reference for the 17th of January when we're recording this. Uh, but will it still be topical on the 2nd of January, 2nd of February when it goes out? I don't know. I was talking to uh, all of Boris Johnson's children the other day. It's the biggest audience I've ever had. That is both a diss on me and on him. Uh, and they all call it Rahalastapa. So uh, it's uh, poor old Boris is having trouble. Neat old Boris Johnson having trouble just just when they got the flat looking nice. Oh, I had a picture there. Look at that. Not working. Fight rubbish. Quite a load of rubbish. Got another picture I wanted to show them. Um, just when they got the flat looking nice. That's what I'm saying. Uh, look, I, I, we're recording this in January. It's going out in February. I'm going to bet you that Boris Johnson is still the Prime Minister regardless. I'm going to give him one million more chances. And then that's it. It's over. For, I'm sorry if that's harsh. He's only got one million more chances for me. And that's, uh, I feel particularly bad about the number 10 parties because I buried my parents on the day of the number 10 parties. They weren't dead uh, and they managed to dig their way out and uh, contact the authorities. All I'm saying, if the PM can break the law, why can't I? That's my point. Now, last week I was talking about um, my daughter. Be good to have the pictures now, but I guess it's not going to happen. Uh, who... Uh, you may remember she uh, she'd drawn a picture of uh, a man called Jeff, and she'd married him, and he was they're now married. Uh, then uh, the next day, she told me that her and Fred had had a baby. I said, "Who's Fred?" Because I thought you were married to Jeff, and she said, "Oh yeah, Jeff. Sometimes I forget his name." Uh, it was me. I was worried that Jeff was the heartbreak. It was Phoebe who's going to turn out to be. She can't even remember the father of uh, the person she's married. Anyway, she told me they'd had a baby who uh, was called Lil. Um, and uh, the pictures are up. There we go. Look, you can see him if you're watching. There, that's uh, Jeff next to Lil. He's definitely the dad from the pink, the pink faces. She's inherited half of his smirk, half of his mouth, uh, and then got another smirk on the other side. It's all happening so fast. I don't know if I'm ready to be a grandfather. I'd plan to bump Jeff off by ripping him to shreds, but I can't do that to a baby. Can a little Lil? Look at her. She's my granddaughter. She's got the same eyes as me. Look at her. She's beautiful. Enjoy your life, everyone. It whizzes by so fast. It only seems like two days ago, uh, my daughter was an unmarried six-year-old. And now look at her with a whole family stuck on a wall. Ah, bloody idiots, aren't they, kids? Right, look, let's crack on. <clears throat> Hopefully my button will work for this. Ah, delicious. My guest this week is probably best known for her portrayal of Miss Grey in S-Band. Will you please welcome the incredible Gronya Maguire, ladies and gentlemen. There she is. Don't... Hello. Hooray. Hello, Gronya. How are you doing? I feel just I'm I'm optimistic all my tech is working. Good. Well, it was we had some dodgy moments before we started, so let's not jinx it. Um, but uh, great to see you. You're in an Airbnb. Whereabouts is the Airbnb? So me and the comedian Hollyburn mm -hmm. are doing a, a writer's retreat. Oh, nice. In 
St. Leonard's. So Holly will be wandering around daubing herself in body paint and I'll be writing jokes about Boris Johnson. So. Okay, that's good. Where is St. Leonard's? I, forgot, I don't, can't work out where St. Leonard's is. What, what it's like part? the hipster... It's the hipster part of Hastings. Okay. All right. That's nice down there. I mean, it's, it's a very bit, nice. It's nice. There's, there's a lot of horrible people there, but it's a nice area. <laughs> if well, you've I've been... always wanted to try heroin, so I'm really excited. <laughs> if you've done comedy gigs in Hastings, have you ever performed in Hastings? I mean, if I have, I've probably blacked yeah. it out. I think I have. I think I have. Yeah, you, but, it's uh, better to blank it out. It's... Uh, it's uh, you know, it's not the it's not the easiest place to play, uh, especially with I imagine your more left leaning uh, comedy. That that's just I'm not being prejudiced against the people of Hastings. That's their job to be prejudiced. So, um, lovely to see Kronya. I can't believe you've not been on the podcast before. Fantastic stand up comedian, uh, podcaster, uh, political commentator, and. Uh, what it was quite the reason uh, that I thought to have you on was because you've got a new podcast out, which we, we, my wife was listening to in the kitchen. So I I could play along with it because I didn't know what the title. I hadn't seen the the blurb, and uh, you, it's called the way they were. We'll get straight into this now. I'm not even you. You host it with a lady called Chantal, whose surname sounds like it, she could be a character in Toast. I'm not going yeah. to. I'm not going to attempt to pronounce her surname. Can you pronounce her surname? I'm going to go. It's Fiducian Pain. Okay. It's just nice to be on a podcast with somebody whose name is more difficult to pronounce than my own. I wondered if that's why you got together. <laughs> <laughs> but it's the way they were, and it's um, <clears throat> it's a neat idea. And what I like about it is that I do think of you as, uh, and and perhaps not entirely, but and it's not entirely fairly because you. You do lots of other stuff as well, but you're sort of known as being quite a political comedian or doing doing a lot of joke comedy about politics. And this is just sort of gossipy, fun exploration. I'm sorry, Gronya, uh, is a but this is not that. This is a look at past relationships and using that as an opportunity to be nostalgic and gossipy and fun about celebrities, right? It's because it's so funny. Like I know nobody pays as much attention to you know other people's careers we do to ours but like i have not done any political jokes on stage since ed Miliband was leader of the labor <laughs> party like i really i hate it i hate it so much but it's so funny that like you know i you know i'm like when people sort of call me a political comedian i always feel so um cringy and embarrassed <laughs> because you know What's really more, but what sort of says more about it as, as a nation, how we feel about Boris and whoever, and how we all feel about Jennifer Aniston and Brad Pitt. You know, <laughs> they are like the runes. They are the, the tarot cards in which, you know, we as a society explore what it means to be human. So I find it fascinating. Yeah, well, but I think it, but it's 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 nice because it's a nostalgia podcast as well. But but then I think it says quite a lot about relationships and love because it's all about people who've broke, who were big, were in big famous relationships, but are now not together anymore. Right. So that's the. But so so we, you're looking at the nature of love, and yeah, you know, sometimes you're surprised that you haven't thought about whether the, the couple are still together or, you know, you'd forgotten they'd broken up or you'd forgotten they were together at all, which is sort of more interesting, perhaps the ones that you kind of think, oh, were those two ever together? How did that work? So it's a very yeah. rich area for, for, for chat, I think. And it's like <laughs> what age you were when they were together, what, how did it influence how you thought relationships would work out, you know, what you projected onto them. Like I am obsessed with Liz Hurley and Hugh Grant. Like, I just... They were such a good couple and they were just so gorgeous together. Like, for me, they are early 90s. Like, they are just so glamorous. And I still... I still think they should get back together. I still... <laughs> they are, were so iconic together. I still, in my heart of hearts, have not accepted that either. They've moved on. I haven't moved on. So yeah, do you think they were ever really together though? Do you think it was? Do you think it was real? I think they were like two very ambitious people <laughs> who suddenly found themselves in a situation where being together worked really well for them. <laughs> Maybe that is a form of love, you know. 
it's well, certainly it. Uh, they a were. I, I did the, a gig. I've talked about a lot. Uh, where in a jeweler shop in about two thousand and two, it would have been. So I was doing Talking Cock, uh, and uh, all the kind of most famous people. It was all the guests. It was all the main customers of this posh jewelers, uh, and Hugh Grant and Elizabeth Hurley. I think were both in. I think Elizabeth Hurley was there. Were both in the in the audience of that, but not together. <gasps> Hugh Grant was the only person who really laughed at any of my jokes and and Liz Hurley. I remember Posh Spice was very confused by everything I said and Elton John <sighs> did not like me. Elton, you got dissed by Elton John? Yeah. Well, then John Robbins, who was engaged to the daughter of the jeweller, I don't, I believe he is no longer engaged. I don't, you know, this he, you could have them as a, one of your celebrity yeah, couples. Yeah, perfect couple. Um, uh, he told me that after, the, after I'd mentioned it on the last podcast I did with him, he said that... That I that they said I'd done some homophobic material, which I and I thought, what did I do? My maybe I did my hand signs thing, but I hadn't because I hadn't written that at that point. And then I thought, no, I haven't. I did the first five minutes of talking cock. That's all I did, which is you know about penises, but it's not. I was really, I was really like flummoxed by it, and I couldn't think at the time whether I had or not. And now, now I want to say John Robbins, I didn't do any harm. <laughs> or that I did a joke where. I said, I was talking about erections, and I said to Elton, you're still standing there, aren't you, Elton? That's Viagra for you. That was all I did. And he did not like that. He did not like me doing a mm -hmm. you're still standing mm -hmm. joke. And that's why it went badly. So it's been... But now you kind of think, what did I... Did I say something? Did I suddenly turn but homophobic in front of Elton John? <laughs> maybe it's just like, imagine you're Elton John, how many you're still standing yeah. Things he probably hears on a daily basis. Maybe he just had had too many. You were still tending. I don't think anyone would. I don't think anyone else would do it to his face. I think he. I think <laughs> I was the first who did that joke to his face. Uh, anyway, we couldn't do his 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 relationship as well. Well, like you could do him and uh, his wife. I suppose you could Elton John and what was she called, yeah. Renata or something? I can't Renata. Yeah. Um, he talked about her in his autobiography, and then she sued him. Oh, that's right. Yeah. So you know, it's a rich, it's a rich source. I was listening to the um, Ellen DeGeneres and Anne Hesh one uh, today, which, but that's uh, and that's I didn't know that Anne Hesh had g gone crazy and gone into someone's house and said she was a goddess of the earth or something and lost her mind. That's, a, that's taking it badly. <laughs> I mean, that is a bad breakup. <laughs> so that's Once you involve aliens. <laughs> that's it. The other person has won. But that was, you know, but the, that relationship is so. You know, and the minute you got this, because it's so much fun to speculate, isn't it? It's a, it's like speculating from. But with both, what we know about both those people now, and what we know about Ellen from more her more recent stories, it must have been a pretty traumatic and difficult relationship of two quite big egos. I would have thought, and it's. Because it was like the first time Anne Hesh had been like out as a gay person. Yeah. You have all of that and then suddenly crazy famous and then like hanging out with the like Quentin Tarantino and the Clintons. That's a lot of pressure in, yeah. you know, the first few months of a relationship. And was it her first gay, was it her only gay relationship? I mean, it's I think so, yeah. because it, cause you, do, you do allude to this briefly in the podcast, but uh, Bowfinger, there's the, Steve Martin's writes a character is it in Bowfinger that that uh, there's a character who just keeps on m marrying or getting relationships with the the person who can help their career the most and that is that was Steve Martin's take on the, the, you would point out that he was like 20 years older than her as well and there's mm. <laughs> there's stuff going on I will tell on. you the person <laughs> our amazing podcast producer loses a base you know, half her weight in stress editing that. No, really? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> the libels. <laughs> yeah. We're oh, not worried dear. about libels here. You can say anything, <laughs> say anything like until someone sues us, and then uh, then then we. Uh... Well, it's it's called the way the way they were, and the they were. Um, very very a, a strong recommend. Very strong start. Oh. Very strong start. I should stop recommending podcasts on this. I do it too much. Cause, you I know. felt so embarrassed, like genuinely, I felt such shame even telling people I was starting a podcast. <laughs> it genuinely, I was like, has it come to this? You know, two years into lockdown, you launch a podcast. Oh, God. Well, it's a difficult time to launch, but there are too many podcasts now. And 
I have to think about yeah. my listenership, and I I will not encourage and do not listen to Bronya's podcast. <laughs> if you listen to it, you have to carry on listening to this one. That's all I'm going to say. But I prefer it. I'd prefer it if you just listen to two of mine rather than one, one of mine and one of hers. That's my that's fair. But uh, I did enjoy it. I don't listen to my own one, so I'm allowed to listen to yours. So that's uh, that's good. So I, I will carry on listening. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm slightly losing my voice. It's due. I've got COVID, and I'm still carrying on. I'm an I'm an amazing. Uh, I, you know, I just what nothing can stop me podcasting. That's all I'm going to say to you. Uh, I was reading your uh, website today, and uh, which is good as well. Um, Thank you. But you have a new. Do you, so you send out a newsletter every month or so, or is it just when you feel well, like it? I was trying to have the discipline of every fortnight, right? But I haven't technically got so. I it will be when I start back every fortnight. Okay. I think it's a. It's well, they're 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 sort of basically articles about mainly failures in your life. You put yourself <laughs> down. Many things that have gone horribly wrong for you. They are very funny, but very mm. honest and very open. For a new, my new, my newsletter is, hey, I'm doing a gig here, and you can listen to the podcast here, and please buy my book. And your newsletter is is some <laughs> incredible stories. I was talking to uh, Laura Jean Marsh before we did the podcast about the one. Uh, the, the fact that you poo with very little warning, which is a fact, yeah. something I didn't know about you. So you don't get yeah. you don't get much between oh I need a poo and the poo appearing. This is quite a personal I'm, thing to to no, get into. You no, know, I'm very much like the dog from Woof, <laughs> but instead of turning into a dog, I poop my pants. Okay. So I don't think if they made a kids TV show about it, it probably wouldn't last as long as Woof. But if anything, I think it would do more, you know, good in the community. Um, but, oh, it's so bad. Like if I've had more than two or three coffees, there could be a platform change and I would get very little notice. <laughs> well, you tell you tell us. I mean, I don't want to blow the story because I would like people to go and uh, read that one for themselves. But you do very, very openly talk about it. Uh, shitting yourself and uh, having to hide it from your boyfriend, which uh, is uh, very funny. But uh, but and and the there's a there's a great one about g- going for to, to be a motivational speaker at a sort of posh girls' oh. school and it all going yeah. quite badly wrong for you. Well, because I thought <coughs> I was like, oh, I don't need to. I I should have prepped, but then I just thought, Do you know what? I'm just going to connect with them because <laughs> I know what it's like, you know, to be a teenage girl, to be like feel like uh, uh, what would I like to hear? And I was like, you know, like failure is just part of everything, and things are going to be shish, and that's fine. And it was only when I got to the school, oh my god, it was like oh, what? It was like the fanciest, like. I went like gym come sports center. It was, and then I just walked into this hall and I suddenly realized none of these girls will ever know failure. (laughs) They will never know failure. And just that suggestion that something might not work out for them. When I said it, they looked so offended and like, (laughs) they looked like offended and sorry for me at the same time. Like, what is this you speak of? And I, I was so convinced I was going to be like Michelle Pfeiffer, Dangerous Minds, connecting <laughs> with the kids. And it turned out the only people I was connecting it with was the teachers at the back who have to work with these rich, entitled little brats. So they were they were like, yeah, yeah, you're right. Life doesn't work out the way you planned. Look at me teaching. It's bloody school. But the actual students, they, they just were, it was... I was so, oh my god! I'm told by pooping my pants. Pooping my pants would have been more <laughs> dignified than what happened, and it was oh my god. Yeah, it was a long train back to central London after that one. Do you, do you feel because you know it's it is more fun to write and read about the gigs that went badly and the times in your life that went badly, and I very much uh, it's lovely to see someone else admitting to those things i think because we've all been through something humiliating or we've all pooed our pants at some point uh and uh, it's nice to see someone talk about it but do you feel 
do you, do you ever? I mean, there may be. I haven't read all of them. There may be some about your triumphs in there, but it seemed to be mainly about your disasters. That your newsletter that you send out is here's my terrible life and this, the foolish things have have happened to me as a result of my. But I think they're the only <coughs> interesting stuff. Like that's the only interesting thing you have of worth to share with people is the humiliations and failures. I just, they're the funniest. There's something funny about, oh, I went on this holiday and it turned out it was really nice. It's so boring. I just think, especially from a comedy point of view, that's where the good, juicy stuff is. And I just think from like, I think that this is going to sound very pretentious, but you know, I think the kindest thing you can be to people is honest and about like your failures. But what's, what I find funny is, I am obviously think, well, if I've articulated this in a newsletter, then it would suggest that um, I, I'm i okay about this. But, you know, like <laughs> friends or aunties will be like, oh, my God, are you okay? I read your newsletter. I'd be like, okay, so if it's at the stage where I'm, you know, <clears throat> sending it out to anonymous email addresses, it's fine. Okay. I'm fine. It is good, but let, you know... Let people know you're very successful and as well. These are just the moments where things have gone wrong. And you know, I do. I completely agree. I think you're absolutely right. And I, I, there's a, there's the story about you doing a gig because your family are, are you're from Ireland and your family are quite. It's quite a Republican. I mean, to say, when I say it's quite a Republican family, I read about your grandfather being shot at by the British forces and only get escaping because they thought they're ricocheting bullets were him for shooting back at them. So yeah. they were very heavily into the, the Republican The cause, movement. it answered the nation's call. Yeah. As he actually, I, did, I didn't even say it in the news session. There's a, my granddad, because he fought, fought in the, um, the Civil War, he broke out for prison. Like he blew himself out for prison. Isn't that mad? Yeah. Well, it's very exciting. And, uh, you know, I... Because I'm partly Irish, like everyone is, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm more on your side than my side, so it's okay. Um, <laughs> I've come from stocky. If you look at me, I've got, I come from the Hannon family of, and I'm a very, I'm a stocky little I, Irishman. Look at me. Why couldn't I've got? Why couldn't I've got some of the genes from the other British Isles? Uh, I the, could see uh, you with a little. I could see you with a rifle. <laughs> Tell him Podrick to remember me. Remember me. I mean, I you are it. you're a sort of you know you're a Labour supporter, so it's you know is is that a cause of stress within the family that your that your politics don't quite align with the historical Maguire's? Well, because what it was so growing up in the nineties, being like, and it was so weird because it's like a completely different country. I don't know why I was so obsessed, but like being like a new Labour fan in Ireland in the 90s was like in my house as rebellious as you could get <laughs> like that was oh my god and me because my parents because you know it's so long it's so weird that I like sometimes I just think it's so mad that like my granddad was part of this like it feels like ancient history but it's like just like I'm just one generation you know um away from it so my parents were really <laughs> <laughs> oh, so I don't know how much I want to go into detail. But <laughs> no, let's just okay. say there's periods of the 1970s, you know, and a few relations I have, a bit of it vague. If I went on, <laughs> who do you think you are? They'd have to skip that bit. <laughs> but they were very like pro, like my mum especially would be like, oh my God, Jerry Adams is a statesman. Jerry Adams, you know, is like a, a will be remembered in the history books as a, you know, person of peace. And I used to get so annoyed. I'd be like, oh, my God, Jerry Adams is a terrorist. Tony Blair. Tony Blair is a politician. <laughs> so um, it's bittersweet. As the years go by, it becomes <laughs> even more bittersweet. But you performed for, you've done a gig for Jerry, well, that Jerry Adams was in the audience for, very like me and Elton John and Hugh Grant and Liz Hurley. It was. So what had happened was, so my sister is a member of the local Sinn Féin party. And like, honestly, now they're more like, like left wing labor, you know, they're, they're a different, uh, they, it's sort of different there now. 
they're not as sexy as they were in the in the 90s you can hear their voices on the news and everything yeah and um, so my it was like a fundraising gig for Sinn Féin my sister sort of like talked me into performing and I didn't really want to but you know um who could turn down a hometown you know return gig I genuinely was like this was the first time I'd ever done stand up in my town I was like oh my god this is gonna be my big moment you know I've moved away to London but now I'm back I'm gonna show them and I I said oh am I gonna be like the headline act and then my sister was like oh no don't be stupid father Ray the singing priest he's the headline (laughs) act but you'll be on like quite towards the end so I thought right that's fine so I go out, so like it's a Republican night. So it wasn't just like all stand up. There was like poems. It was very earnest, very, very serious. There was a whole like mini Michael Collins play in the first section. <laughs> so I bound on, but because I'd only been going about like five, seven years at this stage. So you don't have a stand up set that is very fluid to the situation. So I just did <laughs> my regular club 20 basically and i had this joke in it where i said um you couldn't set the sound of music in ireland mainly because you wouldn't be able to have realistically likable nuns (laughs) and then i could sense like things sort of shifting in the back and then i said and the ending would be different it would just be all the kids being sold to pedophiles in america (laughs) and then i could see movement and then this guy just stood up walked out and then I found out afterwards that was the local priest and then so Father Ray the singing priest was banned from performing at the gig (laughs) because of what I I had said he wasn't allowed to go on stage so the night sort of had to end really sort of quickly and Jerry Adams was in the front row the whole time so I was in a room with Jerry Adams and he was fine but I was the one causing all the problems yeah and he was just he was very charming he looked a bit like a bg he had these amazing big teeth and fantastic hair and yeah. i'd love to chat with them at the end did he did did he speak in his real voice or does he, does he still have someone going around with him doing his voice for him I don't know. It was very sexy, was very exact, confident. That why? Do that why they? That was such. A, you wouldn't. You wouldn't remember those. You would. You're too young to remember those days, though, right? Where, I suppose it was no, the I BBC think... as well, though. Do you remember the days when Shin, so all the Sinn Fein people were voiced by actors? I remember the hinterland, and I it just like a vague sort of memories of it, and I just think. Think of all those actors. That was their main gig. Like nobody thinks about them. <laughs> that would have been a good source. If ever like a a bomb went off, they'd be like, "Oh, great! I'm going to get the phone call tomorrow. This is brilliant." <laughs> but I don't. You know, if the, if he had a very sexy voice that could hypnotize people, then maybe that's it. Do you think that was it? Because I don't understand. Surely it's what he says, not the way he's. You know, if they were going to maybe... censor people, you'd think they would stop people. Ha- hearing the words it's sort of odd it was an odd decision at the time maybe he was like the original asmr where <laughs> his voice was just so baritone and sexy that people were like "Ooh, yeah i feel all i feel all weird <laughs> they wouldn't be able to contain themselves they'd be like give them the six counties back <laughs> we should give ireland back to the irish it's <laughs> it's obvious um well talking of ireland you come from navan is that am i saying that right yeah good perfect thank you uh, and that is a it's it's spawned an awful lot of stand up comedians in the is it Dylan Moran, Tommy Tin and Arthur Matthews who wrote Father Ted? You and anyone else? Me and Pierce Brosnan. Okay. <laughs> I mean he's quite funny. He's he has his moments. Mamma Mia, he was fantastic. <laughs> was that deliberate though in Mamma Mia? Was he being deliberately funny in that? <sighs> I don't, I just, I, so my (laughs) auntie served him in a hotel about 10 years ago and it was just like, you know, bog standard hotel and she went up to him and she went, more carrots, Mr. Bond? (laughs) And he was very nice to her. So I love him so much. That's very nice. What, what is it about Navin that uh, has bred this gen, well, especially more recently, that's, that's, you know, those those three alone, plus you, uh, are uh, the, the, almost the 
It's not almost everyone from from Irish comedy there. I think it's Navin has the biggest lead and zinc mine in Europe. <laughs> right. So I genuinely think we're being slowly poisoned. And that's making your your brains work. And okay. And we've got Sellafield quite near. Okay. So I think, I mean, I think in a hundred years time, people go, how did they not know something was going wrong? <laughs> so rather than these, you're being fantastic comedians, you've just been poisoned and are poisoned. mentally ill. And the yeah. things you're saying just happened to, I mean, just statistically, one in a hundred people in that sit down, <laughs> that will just act, come out accidentally as jokes. For most people, it's just blathering. Um, no, it's 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 an interesting thing where there's a. I mean, I know Ireland has a has a kind of reputation for witty wittiness and clever humour, and but it sort of is surprising. Is how big a town is Navan? It's such a shithole. It is such a shithole. It's basically a town formed around a shopping centre. <laughs> like I cannot emphasise. It's so even like Navan people think it's a shithole. It's so boring. It's so boring. We, yeah, we, yeah. There was like two cinemas when I was there and one was closed down because there was rats in it. <laughs> and we had a swimming pool for a while, but then there was a hole in the roof. So that got closed down. So I think, I genuinely think everybody's slowly losing their mind. Okay. But that's it. We'll see. <laughs> Um, I'd, I'd see, I'd, like many comedians, I'd see you tried uh, clowning, but you didn't get on with clowning. Did you go Did you go to France and do the no. course? No. So I went with Katie, actually. Oh, me you? and a friend of the show, Katie. Um, we, it was just a weekend. And this is what annoyed me. So it was like, everybody, comedians midlife crisis, you do clowning. So I thought, oh, this will be brilliant and it'll be so inspiring and it'll bring it, you know, a lyricism to my stand up. It'd be fantastic. So it's so expensive, like unbelievably expensive. I may have lost you. Oh, oh can you hear me now? Yeah, can yeah, I can. Me? Yeah, sorry. Yeah, you, you froze. My oh. my internet connection is unstable. Aren't we all? <laughs> <laughs> sorry, carry on. Carry on. So r- ruinously expensive. We did, it was for three days. So the first day, the teacher, the guy running the course was like, whenever I tr- got up to do anything, he would say, no, you wanted too much. It's <laughs> horrible. You wanted too much. Looking at you, I want to kill myself. And I was thought, oh, well, you know, I know what this is. He's hazing me. He sees potential. Okay, I'll sit down. Fine, fine. Second day, I get up to do an exercise. Ugh, I want to go to Ikea and build myself a gas chamber to kill myself so I don't have to see this. And I was like, oh, oh okay, fine. Yeah, I'm, I'm entering into the process. <laughs> Finally, third day, I genuinely was like, just let me do one exercise. This has cost me... Six hundred pounds. <laughs> it was such. It was such bullshit. It was such bullshit. It works for some comedians, doesn't it? It's a, a few come back and it changes their lives. <coughs> Scientology. Just do Scientology instead. <laughs> you get to meet Will Smith. <laughs> um, good. I'm going to ask you some emergency questions. Just uh, to sit. Oh well, I know. I know the answer. I know that you have an answer for this one because of your vlog but i'll ask you this one first of all have you ever seen a ghost gronya Maguire? yes i you have, have seen a ghost yes you have i've met a ghost okay tell me about that okay so i was at university okay I was coming home from the student bar this is really important <laughs> my hangover was just about to start so put pin on that hangover just about to start i'm going into my house this is a house that was it belonged to an old couple The woman had died in the house. Her husband was living in an old folks home, but we were renting it, students. So got into the house, hangover just starting, get into bed. I fall asleep. I wake up and it's like my arm, for some reason, has been sort of brought forward. There is an old woman (laughs) at the bottom of my bed. She puts a white disc into the palm of my hand. I pop it into the glass of water by my bed. (laughs) It fizzes, I drink it, go back to sleep, wake over, no hangover. Wow. 
So now how do you explain that? Um, I would say, well, I, you know, I've had the experience where, uh, and someone reminded me of this, where because um, it was in a retro one we put out, that I was a, I was asleep. I mean, hey, you were asleep, Ronya. That's how I explained it. And you think you woke up and you didn't wake up. And I've had quite a lot of experiences like that. I saw the ghost of my son when I was, and it was really real. And he's not dead, importantly. And I reached out to grab him because I thought it was weird. It was so real. And then my my hand went through him. And I think that was a dream. Um, but uh, I've had, there's a uh, there's an archetype of a hag that sits on your chest and kind of tries to choke you when you wake up. So maybe yours is just a nice hag who's but I cares about no you. But I had hangover in the morning. Surely that's science. There was <laughs> well, no hangover. Have you ever, have you never had a night where you've had drunk and not had a hangover? Sometimes you don't get a hangover as bad. I don't it's know. It's sort of. I mean, look. Is it possible? Answer, but... Is it possible? I, you know, I'm just being rational. I'm being like Danny Robbins. I've got to say both sides. It is a good story. But, you know, what ghost gives you an Alka-Seltzer? But is it possible the old woman hadn't died and had just pretended she died to get away from her husband and was still living in a spare bedroom, had seen you and not well and then gave you an Alka-Seltzer to get you through the day? I mean, that does, that is a possibility. And, you know, do those things... say it like that. Do those things ever... I suppose if one is literally from the other side, they brought that back with them from heaven, then they... It just seems a waste of your ghostly powers to stop a girl... (laughs) Having a hangover once. <laughs> if it was a magic pill that stopped you ever having a hangover. It's a good story. I'm going to give you that. I'll give you that. It's the one of the better ghost stories we've had. Um, I like to say it at funerals when somebody's just lost a real loved one just yeah. to give them hope. Yeah. The soul continues. <laughs> a sort of Amazon delivery thing from the ghosts. Yeah. Um, have Gronje, have you ever milked an animal or a human? No, you said so, I feel because like, I, I grew up in the countryside. I feel like I should, but I just was from a very boring part of the countryside. Yeah. Say so again in your in your newsletter, um, again against yourself. There was a a date you had, <laughs> where our first date with someone, where the the man said that you looked like a nun in civvies. Yeah, which you know I can't work out if that is like a a bit. I think it's, there's a sort of el- racist racist element to that. I think. Do you think? Death, one hundred percent. But any time any English person says anything to me, I I first assume they're being, you know, racist against Irish people. Yeah. So, well, I wouldn't do that because as down. as I've said, I'm I'm unlike everyone else. Or I am partly Irish, so I would never do that. It's not a good tact. I mean, that's like. What was his hope in that date? They go, I know, I'll tell her she looks like an, an, an off-duty nun. That should... <laughs> I mean, was that... Do you feel, I wonder if it was... It's not a good chat-up line, but I wonder if it was. he was just voicing his own... Maybe he thought, this is good. He was saying, this is good. I've always wanted to fuck a nun. And you look... Yeah. If you could get the costume, <laughs> you I would really be great. I like the sound of music, yeah. yeah. But, uh, yeah... It's a good story as well. It's a good. It's a, another good story. So I'll ask you. I'm going to go for another emergency question. Um, the humiliations of life. It's all copy. It is. Well, it's you know. But as a comedian, it's I'm right. I'm writing this book now uh, about about ha- having a testicular cancer and losing a testicle. And I'm you know before when I thought that I didn't. I, I was went into initially and they said, "No, you're fine. It's not going to be cancer. It's going to be something else." And I was slightly disappointed because I thought, ah, oh, that would have been a good, I could have got a good show out of that. I was generally, there was an, I mean, I was happy, but there was a big element of disappointment in, in me. And, you know, that came back to bite me, literally, <laughs> not quite on the bum, just near the bum, bit me and I lost a ball. So, you know, careful what you wish for, Gronje, is what I'm saying. You should you shouldn't have put it on your vision board. That's who you made the mistake. <laughs> I did. I did. Um, uh, what is the strangest thing you found in your cleavage, belly button, or anal cleft, Gronje Maguire? Uh, have found anything? I think I've def- definitely found crisps. Yeah, definitely. Um, in in all three areas, or just in all three areas. <laughs> <laughs> it was a good night out. <laughs> It's good. It's like 
like one of the the, the advantages of being a woman you know you have to <laughs> biologically be better at hiding food from sneaky men so that's why we've got all these creases and, and clavicles <laughs> well it's, you know it would be nice to have crisps i haven't i guess i could get in my belly but i could get them in my anal cleft i don't check i don't check my anal cleft as much as i should probably for crisps do you think that's what is it like self-perpetuation so the more you put on weight the more areas in your body there are to store food that's true the skinnier yeah. you are yeah nothing you're right you're right so then yeah and then you've, there's always food and then it's just it's like your body's way of keeping you it's better to you know it's better to be overweight that's that's why your body wants you to be overweight because it's better in case there's yeah. a famine or something and then you, you can just sit back and you know yeah. and then doubly so if you can harvest food from yourself <laughs> if you can find if you need what we need is sort of some smoked meats really i suppose something like that something that will the, you can leave there for several months and then come back to yeah. it and it will still be edible the danger is under each boob yeah a load a lot and that would probably you know people would probably wouldn't it would just think it was part of your body yeah, it's... Or they or they'd be like you'd smell. They'd be like, I I I just I don't even want to know. They'll just leave you to your food. <laughs> yeah, it would be a sad existence. Now you've been in America recently, and uh, again another lovely newsletter about your engagement. Congratulations on becoming engaged against sort of against your <laughs> wishes, morals, <laughs> yeah, your morals. But you know, you come out of that story badly as well. I think. <laughs> And your fiance seems like a lovely, lovely man. Oh my god! <laughs> and I'm delighted that uh, you you decided to get engaged and have been married. Uh, I saw a photo of you. Now I, I couldn't find it again, but I saw a photo. I presume on social media somewhere. With were you with Seth Myers or it was with was it Seth Myers? My 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 good friend Seth Myers. What were you friend doing with Seth podcast. Myers? Oh my god, it was just incredible. So over lockdown, I became obsessed with American late night shows. Okay. You know, you're Stephen Colbert. I started having really intense sex dreams about Stephen Colbert, <laughs> Seth Meyers, um, all of them. And uh, then I was going to New York and I managed to get um, a ticket to go see a recording and I managed to get a backstage pass wow. to meet Seth Myers. and when I tell you I was so nervous that for about three days I genuinely <laughs> hoped I would get a positive COVID test <laughs> because I was so terrified about it. I was so nervous and then um, Brian Cox was a guest so he was sort of hovering around backstage and I basically bullied Brian Cox into posing <laughs> for a picture with my fiance um, and <laughs> I Logan murrayed him. Not Logan, but I keep saying Logan Murray. Logan Royd. Oh, Logan yeah, Murray's Logan a stand-up comedian. I Logan Royd him into posing for a picture. But um, it was amazing. He was so like charismatic and gorgeous and just as you would want him to be. He was so lovely. <laughs> oh, that's nice. And did Logan you... Roy. Seth Myers wasn't bad either. <laughs> okay. Do you, do you did you suggest you could write for him? Because you write for a lot of you write for a lot of UK shows, a lot of topical shows. You could write well, for him. Well, you see, this is, this is why I was so nervous, because in my head, I was like, okay, what would, like, a real go-gesher do? Well, a real go-gesher <laughs> would be like, hey, Seth, oh, great sh great jokes, but hey, shall I pitch you some more? And then I thought, <laughs> oh, no, that would be awful. That would be a nightmare. So I tried to just, as much as possible, be like, hey, we're just two people in the industry chatting to each other. <laughs> that was what I was trying to achieve in our four minutes talking to each other. Oh, but he was very nice. He was so lovely. That's good. And if you're listening, I would happily write for your show, Seth. I'm sorry I didn't say that to you. Send I should have some, said it. Send him some jokes in. Send him some jokes in now. Um, well, I'll mention this. Uh, I don't know. This was a little while ago, I think, wasn't it? When you uh, live tweeted your menstrual cycle to the uh, Irish... Now, I want to say T-Shock. I don't know how to say that word. Uh, there you go. Perfect. And to uh, <laughs> Kenny. I just think of T-Shop and then change the end to T-Shock. That's how I do it. And I want to say Edna Kenny, Kenny but it's Enda Kenny. And uh, so, you know, like, good Ed. I've done pretty well. I've done pretty well of uh, getting my Irish right. Why was that just for a bit of fun, Ronya? Or was there a, was there a purpose behind that? Well, it's just like, so at the time, uh, abortion was illegal in Ireland and it's just like so horrific and just like a nightmare situation. And it's so like, it's really hard when things are that 
bleak and upsetting to try and find a comedy angle yeah <laughs> could be very hard because it's like overwhelming you have to go through this wall of rage and um i just always kind of hoped because i kind of feel like i don't know if you feel like <laughs> this but you never want to be earnest and whenever i tweet about anything i feel that i feel really passionate about i always try and think is there a way i can make this point while being funny like because I'm not, there's nothing worse than, guys, let's just take a moment, blah, blah, blah. I hate it. Yeah. So I came up with an idea to try and highlight how awful it is that a government would get involved in something so private as a woman's health, you know, um, that I thought, well, okay, fine. Well, you, you've invited yourself there. So I'll just tell you in explicit detail when my next period is. Yeah. And uh Yeah. It was, it, it was like a big, it was like a moment in Ireland that I was like part of, you know, sure. I think everybody was just collectively fed up yeah. of um, the, how awful it was. And thankfully they changed it. Yeah. Do you think it was because of you just to stop you t- t- doing that? Yeah. I think, is, is that's I think all it so, takes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if only we'd known all that time. Just be, just be, you know, slightly make someone feel slightly uncomfortable. <laughs> make a man talk about tampons against his will that's <laughs> all it takes but it is interesting i think you're right and i've seen you say this as well that it's sort of you know the th- humor when you're doing political stuff which i know you don't do all the time Gronya, um <laughs> that you know it's 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 a it's not being partisan which is obviously quite difficult to some extent but it's 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 about not preaching. It's about finding the funny and finding the. I saw you on a clip where you were talk, that some guy had written a book of uh, Jeremy Corbyn jokes, and you were you were on uh, the Daily Politics or something like that as a Jeremy Corbyn fan. And I think they thought, oh, we'll get someone on, and then they'll be furious that people are joking about Jeremy Corbyn. And this guy did some, you know fairly weak jokes about Jeremy Corbyn that weren't really about him were just uh, joke it was fine but you were very much like yeah great we should we should do jokes about everything and it's funny it's good to be able to laugh and it, we sort of seem to have lost that a little bit within politics and within joking about politics perhaps do you think that's down to Twitter I think I just oh it's so I just think it's when you're earnest it's absolute kryptonite for comedians when you want applause instead of laughter and when you're not willing to be the idiot because I just think even if you're talking about you know Boris Johnson or Trump or all these things you have to ultimately be an idiot in it too it can't be just like this is why I'm right and all these other people are idiots because I just think it's so boring and tedious and I think it's that vulnerability that doesn't translate onto Twitter and then I think it's it is really tribal and people aren't willing to well, not people aren't willing I mean I think comedy is as good now as it's ever been you know it's the, it's the same <laughs> but I think bad political comedy is when the comedian isn't willing to be an idiot yeah. as well as the people that they're attacking. Yeah, I think there's there's definitely some. I mean, it's you know, as a comedian, you're allowed to make some serious points if you want, but I think, yeah, I think the the ultimate thing should be the laugh and it should be finding the funny way of getting there, which that's, that's you know, the menstrual cycle thing is perfect for that because it's just, it's finding the angle that uh, that will that will mm-hmm. make people laugh as well as think about it. So it's it's, it's both, you know. Just yeah, I think mm-hmm. I think that's a, a a very good point. Um, and you uh you've disappeared. Oh my goodness! Oh, you're back. Thank goodness. Oh, back. Just oh. plugging my laptop in. That's... I'm a girl boss. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh god, there's so many good stories in your newsletters. It's insane. I'd forgotten about you being you being uh you being <laughs> you being an usher at a theatre. And uh, being rude to, well, being uh, offensive to Chris Marshall from my family. Oh, That's a good story. I was story. so awful. I was so, I, I, whenever I see him now on television, it's so flashbacks. I was so awful. I got bullied him. I was so <laughs> awful to him. And then he was in the BT ad, so he'd pop up and, oh my God, I've got beef. I've got a celebrity beef, me and Chris Moore. I'd love to beat him and just hash it out because we could be friends. But I fear he'll never forgive me. And why would he? Why would he trust me after what happened? But did he? So you were drunk and he put you in a cab after yeah. this. So you were rude to him. You, you, he put you in a cab and then you didn't have any money. So the cab drove back and asked Chris Marshall for the money for the cab. And did he pay it for the cab? He paid it. 
Did you ever pay him? I tried to, I tried to pay. This is how drunk I was. I tried to pay for that taxi with a disc man. <laughs> I tried to pay it with a disc man. <laughs> Oh, the mid noughties were a uh, more innocent time. They were well. Uh, he was not according he was to so last lovely. Yeah. Uh, um, well, but did you give him the money back later? No, no, I, didn't. I, I think didn't. we should. I think we should arrange for you to pay Chris Marshall back. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if he remembers. Oh, I bet he does remember. I mean, I'd say he does. That the Almeida Christmas party <laughs> he was doing. The mis the misanthrope. Yeah, the misanthrope. And I said that. He, yeah, he said. He, I said. I. Uh, you. You think you're really funny, but you're not as funny as you think you are. <laughs> oh my god. It's true. That is true. You just, it's true of us you all. Were it's true the of truth. us all. I like Chris Marshall. He got run over, didn't he? Do you remember when he got run over? I it's, thought maybe he, this is me. Yeah. This is maybe I am responsible for that because, you know. I can't stress when I see him so much. If he's genuinely, Chris, if you're listening, I'm very sorry. You were in the right and yeah. I was in the wrong. Give him his money back. I can't believe, I would just, if I'd been Chris Marshall and if I'd been at a party and then I'd someone had been rude to me and then they I'd put them in a cab and then the cab came back and said, presumably wanted to double fare because he had to come back. So he would need the money for the fare and the money for taking you back home again. I would say, no, I'm not paying for that. I'm Chris Marshall. She can pay us. I'd just dump her in. She can sleep in the stalls. Oh, Absolutely you see, outrageous. He, that's why he's that's why he's the nation's sweetheart. It is because he paid he paid for my taxi. Yeah. he's a good man. He is a good man. Makes up for you know the being in love actually, isn't it? Makes up for that that crime against humanity. Um. Uh. Well, look, you're a fan of museums. I have a museum based uh, oh. question for you. Uh, if you could have, if all the world's art galleries and museums in the world got together, said we love Gronje Maguire, she was rude mm -hmm. to Chris Marshall, but we'll forgive her. And as a reward for all the pleasure she's given us with her wonderful career of mainly political stuff, but occasionally some other stuff, she can have one item from any museum or art gallery. What would, what one item would you like to own from all the world's museums and art galleries that you could keep? I will tell you what it is. Yeah. It's the recreation of a Victorian pub in the Museum of London. <laughs> wow, okay. <laughs> and you want to I just, I just love it because sometimes, because you can just walk in. <laughs> and I just think, for, this is my dream. This is my dream. I would love to be famous slash successful enough that I, you know, they get away with like being like all these weird whimsies. I would love to be like so eccentric <laughs> and successful enough that I would only do my business meetings in the Victorian pub in the Museum of London. Like that's where you would meet me and we would have like a normal business <laughs> meeting, but it would be there. But would you take, would I, I imagined you were saying, right, I'm taking this and I'm putting this in my flat or wherever I live. This, this is going to be mine now. And people have to no, come no, to no. Us. It would stay, stay where. So it would people, stay. It would st stay there. People could enjoy just, it. It'd be my workspace. It'd be like my personal we work, and you know, producers or people would be like, "Oh well, okay, we could get wrong here." But the thing is, she only <laughs> takes meetings in the Museum of London Victorian Pub. Okay. On the recreation Victorian High Street. I've got. So that's where you would meet. I've me. got some questions about it. Is there other actors pretending to be Victorians in the in it, or is it just this is what a pub looks like? Or is it so it's, interactive? it's just what a pub looks like. Okay. It's it's a normal pub. It would carry on like a normal working museum, <laughs> but I would be there just doing my everyday admin, okay. ignoring everybody. And you're sitting at the bar or are you sitting at a, a table at the back you would have, or is it? The, the table at the back. There's a nice little table okay. at the back. I'd be sat there, charging my phone, maybe glaring at people when they walked in. Okay. You can't sit. Would you be allowed to take your phone in if it's a Victorian pub? Wouldn't you have to blend in with the the right time frame i think i would be allowed but nobody else would. okay or could you just have like on your could you have like an old one of those phones <laughs> on the table that would just go good your mobile would push through to i think we could work it out maybe uh, carrier pigeons yeah okay that's good well i you know no one's chosen that before 
Out of all the people we've have asked that question to, no one's uh, ever ever done that. What a power move! What a power move it would be. <laughs> be like, she's great. She's read the script. She's got a few ideas. But you do know, the only place she takes meetings is the Victorian <laughs> Recreation High Street in the Museum of London. I, you know, I think if you get to the point where Steven Spielberg and people are coming down there, then I I, I want to see it. I think that's good. Um. I'm going to ask you a question from my new book, still available, which hangs, would you rather? Still, all these books are still available. Um, let me see. I asked that one last week. I can't find the right one for you. No, I'm not going to ask you that. Okay. Would you rather live in a society ruled by children aged six and under or have to be tied to the wheel at a water mill and be spun round for the next 13 hours. If you choose the water wheel, your head will only be underwater for about 30 seconds of each revolution, but it'll be very sunny and you won't be allowed sun cream or to be released from the water wheel to go to the toilet. And we know what problem that's going to be for you. <laughs> the, mean... ch the children will carry on ruling society for at least five years, maybe more if they do a better job than the current lot. So it's either five years of our country being governed by six-year-olds or 13 hours of you being sunburnt and drenched in a toilet-free oh. water wheel. And so these little, like, child kings, yeah. are they sort of picked from all across, you know, different social... How are they chosen? I think we, we would find... I think it would be... To be fair, to give it a chance, I think they would be chosen from, you know, each school maybe would put one... Six, five or six-year-old forward. This is the person we think would be best to rule the country. And then it would be a parliament of six, the 600 best would be chosen and would be able to vote on stuff. But, you know, I've got a six-year-old and I don't know how much they'd concentrate and stuff. There'd be a lot of laws I... about poo. That's all I can tell you. So get, that might, could be difficult for me. It could be difficult, might suit you. <laughs> might be you can just poo. Might, if it was my son who's four, it'd be, I just want to... Is it... You're allowed to poo on people's heads. That's sort of, that would be all he would want. Because I think they would be amazing at like the you know the big big stuff. You know yeah. everybody has to be kind and share stuff. But it's like the logistics, like whoever, like whatever five year old was in charge of like bin collection. <laughs> I just, I would worry. I would really worry about that. Or like the situation, like negotiating with Syria. Do we? You know, do we talk to that government or? So I think I would worry about the children involved in that. Yeah. So I would go. I'll go for the wheel. So you'd be prepared to spend thirteen hours on a water wheel. I mean, risking possible death to prevent that. That's very, very bold of you. Think of the Edinburgh show. Think of the Edinburgh <laughs> show off the back of it. You probably that would be a newsletter. <laughs> Get a newsletter out of that. You would. You would. So, are you uh, are you planning to do an, a a new a new show, a new Edinburgh show, maybe, or is it? Is... Rich, I genuinely think this year in Edinburgh is going to be the Hunger Games. <laughs> it's going to be insane. It's going to be all these attention seekers who haven't had, you know, daily reviews of the show for two years. I think. It's going to be so insane. So I'm very happy to sit this one out. Yeah, sit this one out. Do you not think it'll be absolutely I don't know. I, I, I wonder. I wonder whether, people, you know, there will be people who are very, very hungry to get back to it. But I want, I, I almost wonder by, I know it did happen a bit last year, but almost by being sort of stopped that I think a few people will think, why did I, you know, the, the, the moat will fall from their eyes. They go, why was I doing that every year when I could, you know, I've, in lockdown, I've done this, I've done this, I've done this and got more attention. Mm -hmm. I think the way, you know, I think there, there are lots of great reasons for doing Edinburgh and those are the reasons you should always have been doing it. But the, for a lot of the people going there, they're thinking, I could get discovered, I could get this. And I think those mm -hmm. kind of people would go, why don't I just uh, tweet out a few funny videos of myself? Because that's where everyone's coming from now, isn't it? That's where... The, the names that get picked out, the people who are, who come up with a good idea online. So I don't know. I don't know. I think it's brilliant. I think Edinburgh being put off for two years is the best thing that has ever happened to UK comedy. I just think it's so brilliant. It's so brilliant. It's so, it's, it, you know, people aren't getting into huge debt. It's all these new voices. 
it's so, I just think oh, I think it's fantastic. I really think it's been so good for everybody. Well, you know, it's been into, it's a little fire break, and it'll be. I think it will. I think the fringe will return, and I think it. You know, there's so much. There's only good things about the fringe, but I think it has become sort of unfeasible and weird. And I just I, my my feeling is that more people. I, I might you might be surprised, and maybe people won't do it. That uh, you know, my I think we're going to do some rehalastapas up there. So, I do, but I was thinking of doing a stand-up show, but I don't know if I can. I don't know if I want to go up for a whole month and put myself through that. So, just yeah. enjoy your lovely life. Yeah, I could <laughs> could do could try what's left of it. What what little is left of it. So, what's is there anything else coming up? There's the podcast, the way they were. Do check that out. Is there anything else we should be looking out for with? Gronya Maguire attached to it. The no. newsletter. My newsletter is my little <laughs> letters in my little letters in a bottle that I chuck into the sea of the internet every fortnight. Um, I really enjoy doing them. My little, I'm like a, everybody's little pen pal, uh, <laughs> and that and my podcast. That's... That's well, they're both absolutely excellent, and I do recommend both. So do check those out. Uh, and whenever you're back doing a new stand-up show, go and check out Gronje Maguire's very, very good stand-up. Not, not as political as you'd think. <laughs> mainly I've got amazing ma- stuff on Ed Miliband <laughs> and his political future. Mainly, mainly political, but not. And she was Miss Grey in S-Band as well. Let's never forget that. So uh, thank you very much, Gronje, for coming on the show. Uh, and uh, we'll see you soon, I hope. And uh, good luck with everything. Grandy McGuire, ladies and gentlemen. Hooray! Thanks very much. We'll be back next week. We've got a special guest from America next week. It's a secret. Ooh. See you then. Bye. How'd you like them sky potatoes? <laughs>